Good evening everyone, time for another silver update. We're going to start out with the BTC US dollar chart. So I said the other night it was looking kind of toppy and definitely so you can see that we dropped about $2,800, $2,900 today. Pretty big move. This is the daily chart. So you can see right here, pretty big down day. We're, we're coming down to this uh, trend line. It's been in place since fall of 2023. So it's a pretty important uh, trend line. If we get a penetration to the downside, uh, support might be 50,000. Uh, are we going to get another one of these uh, tops here? Starting to look like it. The indicator, we'll pull out to the weekly just to see. The indicator on the daily is still bearish. And you can see the indicator on the weekly has just rolled over recently. So that's pretty bearish as well. So yeah, long-term support is all the way back down at the the, the first bull, real serious BTC bull market back in 2017, 2018 at 20,000. Uh, that's a long ways away. Uh, there, there is other support, maybe 50,000, but yeah, if, if we get through that, that's a pretty big air pocket. So hold on to your hats if we get through this trend line. Uh, I wanted to look at the NASDAQ real quick. It's looking a little toppy, nothing really serious. You can see that the trend lines I've drawn here, it's kind of an exponential thing. The old support way back here at 5,000, the top of the NASDAQ bubble. I think we got, what was it? Was it an 80% bear market in the NASDAQ? No, more. Uh, five. We went roughly five thousand down to a bottom around eight hundred. It was a real uh, serious bear market. Is there another bear market coming in the Nasdaq? Maybe. Uh, I've recently looked through a lot of world stock charts, including countries like Argentina, Venezuela, Turkey, and other countries that. Uh, have inflation or hyperinflation and I think Peter Schiff said the other day that uh, when asked on CNBC one of the guests was asked you know what, well, what are you recommending for an inflation hedge if, if you're foreseeing a future inflation and the guy said stocks Peter thought that was pretty funny but actually I think if you look at it it uh, stocks pretty much unless some catastrophe happens in the currency or the the interest rate markets stocks just kind of trend right up with inflation i don't think they keep up with inflation so you're not you're not staying ahead but you're not falling behind as fast as other things if that makes sense so jump on over to the silver market And we'll have to pull in here, maybe pull into the 30 minute, one hour, something like that. So silver kind of looks like Bitcoin, same kind of trend line. Uh, doesn't go back as far, but we're just kind of testing, coming up to this area. And the indicator has bounced, so it's hard to say. But we're definitely approaching an inflection point because we've got this resistance trend line coming down here, this long support trend line coming up here, and then we've got this $30, roughly $30 price here. And it comes in right in the center of, let me readjust the chart real quick. Um, if you scroll within that uh, area, it messes it up. So you can see we're coming into an inflection point. It, it seems to be just maybe 
weeks away at the at the most and i expect a fairly significant move when we get through that longer term looking at the indicator the weekly is still bullish it's in overbought territory but as i said before serious overbought territory ran all the way up to six, uh, almost 2000 we're only at about 200 the rally that brought us to 30 initially went all the way up to 500 so there's room to run on this indicator i would not call this a significantly overbought market at this point uh, the longer we spend above this point here and around 30 the stronger it is simply because it really hasn't spent that much time there even though 30 seems like not that high of a price. Uh, we've really spent most of our time beneath 30 in the last 15 years or so. So the rest of the time I want to talk about, I mentioned before the Morgan dollar and the melt. A couple of things uh, back to this NGC melt site. A couple of things I wanted to point out before we look at the Morgan so I imagine not many of you were around in 1964, but 1964 was the big year, 63, 64 for silver, because this is when they demonetized, they, they uh, removed the silver content from most US coinage. Now there's some exceptions. There, for example, there's this Eisenhower dollar here. And you can see that that was for, from 1971 through 1976, it was 60% copper and 40% silver. They're worth about nine bucks. I had, I had some in the past, but I don't have them anymore. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is, well, we know that the Franklin half ended in 1963 and then they bumped off the president and we got the 64 Kennedy and you can just I think that's the biggest rabbit hole that's ever existed is the Kennedy assassination um, and this affected dimes so the dime the quarter yeah the Washington quarter series goes all the way back to 1932 and the half dollar and the dollar affected, those were all affected. And then there was the brief period of 65 through 70 for the half. I don't think it was the case for the quarter. Yeah, the half dollar was a 40% silver coin from 65 through 1970. So they kind of phased us out of silver slowly, first abruptly and then slowly. Um, but that's that's a story with the demonetization of American money. Now we're gonna talk about the Morgan and the Pittman Act, but uh, this is a really good article on finest known site site for exquisite rarities and it's a really interesting history of the morgan silver dollar now i don't have time to go through this whole article it's uh it's very interesting story and the main things i wanted to point out were some points about before we get to the pitman act I want to talk about briefly about the Comstock load. So the Comstock load was a discovery. I'll just read this here. In 1859, gold prospectors on the way to the California gold rush discovered that the sticky blue gray soil they were digging in along the Carson River in Nevada was pure sulfuret of silver. An old prospector with the gift of gab named Henry Comstock convinced the two miners who made the discovery that it was on his property and he had already staked the claim but agreed to a partnership to avoid any argument. The Comstock load became the richest silver mine in American history. Comstock and the others 
claim started to rush to Washoe and brought thousands of miners with silver fever to Virginia City area and became a dominating event in Nevada's history. Over the next two decades, the Comstock load produced more than $300 million in 19th century dollars. There were six major bonanzas the first five years of production. The mines declined after 1874, although underground mining continued sporadically into the 1920s. Today, Nevada is known as the Silver State because of the silver produced from the Comstock load. So that was a big event in American history. And it's kind of interesting that uh, the effect on it, we're going to see how it affected the gold-silver ratio uh, in this coverage of the crime of 1873. So they summarize that saying, the Comstock load in 1859 upset the 16 to 1 gold to silver ratio. Silver prices lowered, which resulted in a flood of silver dollars causing the gold standard to be endangered. Interesting. Britain wanted to increase control of America's money supply and a British banker was given $5 million to bribe Congress to demonetize silver. Wow. Okay. I guess things never change, do they? We've got crooked bankers. We've got the British. Uh, we're going to see we're going to have wars, bribery, and Congress. So, 150 years. Has anything changed? I don't think so. President Ulysses S. Grant signed the Controversial Mint Act of 1873, demonetizing silver and omitting the silver dollar and abolishing the right of silver bullion holders to have their metal struck into legal tender coins, which put the nation firmly on the gold standard. And you know that's what the bankers wanted the whole time. But the silver interests in the West, known as the Silverites, fought the Eastern gold advocates known as the gold bugs and news press called it the crime of 1873, which became a major political platform. The Bland Allison Act, the mint of 1873 became a rallying point between Western mining interests and the Eastern banking concerns. The Western miners were outraged about the crime of 1873 and they spent the next five years fighting to get the act repealed and earning respect that silver deserved. The solution was the Bland-Allison Act of February 28, 1878. Congressman Richard Bland, known as Silver Dick, because of his advocacy of free silver, co-sponsored the act with Republican William Allison. The Bland-Allison Act helped the United States return to bimetallism and was the birth of the Morgan silver dollar. So this is uh, when they initially released the Morgan. We're just giving you some history here because we're going to go and look at the um, Pittman Act. And there's the Carson City Mint. There's the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. During 1889, the falling price of silver made the Western silver interests desperate for increased government subsidies, while Eastern bankers wanted additional paper currency. Senator John Sherman introduced legislation that was a marriage of convenience for both groups, requiring the Treasury to purchase nearly twice as much silver as before and adding substantially to the amount of money already in circulation. In 1870, the Sherman Silver Purchase Act was passed by Congress to succeed the Bland-Allison Act. It required the government to purchase at least 4.5 million ounces of silver monthly and to coin a minimum of 2 million silver dollars per month for the first year. It also required the mine owners to be paid in treasury notes redeemable in gold, which eventually led to a run on the treasury's gold supply. Sound familiar? So this is this struggle, this battle between bankers who are interested in gold and miners and ranchers that are interested in silver. It's a pretty complicated topic. Uh, we're going to see when we get to the Pittman Act and the involvement of India. I don't know if America was so flush with silver why they just didn't open up trade with India. But there's a lot of nefarious groups involved and there's a lot of shady dealings. 
So this leads to the Panic of 1893. By 1893, the Treasury vaults overflowed with silver dollars and minting of dollars dropped sharply. The production of Nevada mines began to decrease and silver prices continued to fall worldwide. Farmers in the West had overextended debt. Railroads expanded faster than demand, with several going bankrupt in 1893. The government's gold supply was running out because they were buying silver instead of gold. The panic struck Wall Street by the end of 1893 when over 15,000 businesses and 500 banks collapsed with runs on the banks. It was a very serious economic depression that began in 1893 and ended in 1897. So a four-year depression. This was a serious depression. Uh, the People starved to death, just like people starved to death in 1929, uh, depression that started in 1929. There was a lot of people that starved to death in this panic of 1893. So this leads us to the Pittman Act. More than a half a billion Morgan dollars were struck from 1878 through 1904. When the silver reserves were finally depleted in 1904, the mint ceased to strike the Morgan dollar. The U.S. Treasury vaults were full to the brim with Morgan silver dollars by the beginning of World War I. German propaganda discredited the United Kingdom's currency, which led to a run on the British supply of silver. The Pittman Act in 1918, a solution that was a federal law sponsored by Senator Key Pittman of Nevada, the act authorized the conversion of not exceeding 350 million standard silver dollars into bullion to help pay for the wartime efforts and conserve the gold supply. This resulted in the melting of over 270 million Morgan dollars for sale of bullion overseas to buy bullion from mining companies at above market rates. So that's uh, their take on the Pittman Act. There's a more detailed article that's on PCGS site, and that's the grading service that grades the numismatic coins. So this is a very interesting article titled, How Morgan Dollars Became Indian Rupees. Little thought is given by many on the previous incarnations of the metal that the coins they have once were. Yet, truth be told, the metallic content of many coins cannot be traced to their origins if their sources were previously melted coins, with some exceptions. One such exception entails the silver rupee coins from India, where many of the silver issues of George V after 1917 can trace their silver content back to the United States Morgan dollar. With the outbreak of World War I, silver coin shortages caused many issues in Europe and other parts of the world, with economies that were dependent on the silver standard, such as the British colony of India, this was a significant problem. Because of the scarceness of silver, India was having a hard time redeeming its currency for silver upon demand. So we have a shortage of silver in India, and we had a glut of silver in America. So what did they do? They melted our silver and gave it to the British. They say they sold it, they probably gave it. And uh, like I mentioned in the earlier video, this is how they won World War I using uh, supplies from India. Redeeming its currency for silver upon demand, Nevada Senator Key Pittman introduced the now well-known Pittman Act of 1918, which would allow the United States to loan Great Britain silver bullion from melting United States silver dollars held in a Treasury Department vaults. The Pittman Act called for not more than 350 million silver dollars to be converted into bullion and sold to Great Britain at the rate of $1 plus mint charges per ounce. With the passage of the Pittman Act, two... 170 million silver dollars in the Treasury Department vaults in the San Francisco and Philadelphia mints were melted, with their silver being shipped to Calcutta to be recoined into Indian rupee coins featuring the effigy of King George V. So they show you here's the Morgan, and then here is this one rupee India 1919 coin there. Besides melting over 270 million. Morgan dollars, the Pittman Act had other consequences. The act required that an equal number of silver certificate banknotes 
be removed from circulation due to the inability of redemption because the equivalent silver dollars were no longer in United States holdings. From this, the first Federal Reserve banknotes were printed in $1 and $2 denominations. Pittman, always the promoter for Nevada silver mining, also required the United States to repurchase the silver at a fixed price of $1 per ounce and the equivalent number of silver dollars to be recoined. This occurred starting in 1921 with the first Morgan dollar coin to be struck since 1904 and also led to the introduction of the United States peace dollar which was minted from 1921 to 1935. So there's your Federal Reserve $2 banknote. And what does it say here? Secured by United States certificates of indebtedness or United States one-year gold notes deposited with the Treasury. So this is a conversion. Now, now you, I've mentioned before, we had silver certificates. You could turn your silver certificates in for silver. And this happened in, I think it was 1964. I think it's covered in this article, maybe not. But in 1964, the they stopped accepting, well, they stopped minting silver in the coinage and started reducing that. But they also supposedly discovered a whole bunch of silver dollars and they started to, and people started to redeem their silver certificates because those were still in circulation. So there was in essence, a run on silver at the time. But this note here, this $2 Federal Reserve note, and this is, this is the thing we're coming to revisit again, um, but it's gonna be different this time, but it's the same and it's different. It just keeps happening over and over again. We've got silver, gold, bankers, presidents, bribed politicians, war. These themes keep coming back. I'm afraid it's coming back again. And this time, I'm not sure what they're going to do. I don't think they know what they're going to do. But you can see here, this is something I did not know before reading this article, that the Federal Reserve is intimately connected with the retirement of silver as money. And it's no surprise that uh, the same people, at least in my opinion, it's no surprise that the same people are organizing again to suppress silver. They've been doing it for 30, 40, 50 years. Now silver is not what it was back then. Um, as I mentioned, I thought that the United States should have just opened up trade with India. But again, the British were involved there. The Indians needed silver. The United States had silver. Uh, now, the I believe it was the Coinage Act, or it may have been in the Constitution. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was the Coinage Act, which defined the U.S. dollar in grains of silver. Now, why is it a problem to have a gold silver ratio? Why can't you use both as money? Well, it becomes a problem when you peg it. If you peg the ratio and then you have something like this Comstock load. So basically when the Comstock load happened, the uh, United States, I mean, most normal people would think, okay, so there are miners that are going to California. They're interested in, there's a gold rush. And then it turns out that they have a bonanza and they discover a whole bunch of silver. Now you would think that that means that the country that that was discovered in is a whole lot richer, right? That would make us a whole lot richer. But that's not the reaction. 
it was uh, supposedly very inflationary because it, it depressed the price of silver, which that's no big deal. But if the price of silver is fixed to the price of gold, it is a big deal. Because anytime you interfere in markets, and, and that's the bottom line here. That's the bottom line of what's going on today. It's the bottom line of what happened then. And it's pretty much been the bottom line for the recent history, uh, recent mean, meaning maybe the last two or 300 years of the history of bankers is interference in the markets. If they would have just let the markets sort themselves out, you don't need to fix gold to silver. You can just let silver trade freely, let the people use it as money. Um, if the whole, whole lot of money is discovered, well, you're a whole lot richer, right? Let's say the United States has a certain amount of silver, and because of this bonanza, the silver supply doubles. India wants silver. Why don't you take your silver and buy things from India? You don't need to convert it to gold. So you can see behind all these stories, you can see these evil banksters floating around because these people are, I'm not sure what the term would be. Maybe narcissists, maybe psychopaths, maybe sociopaths, but they're people that are interested in controlling other people. They're interested in getting rich off the work of other people. Uh, they're not interested in free markets, which are the reason we have wealth. The, the two biggest causes of worldwide wealth are, are free markets and free trade. These people don't like either of those. They wanna control things, they wanna dictate things. Now, obviously, we know from history that communism is a completely broken system, but actually, a central bank is one of the key tenets of communism. So we're still in this struggle. We'd like to see free money. Back then, there were people advocating free silver. We'd like to see, at least I would like to see, whether it's in Venezuela, whether it's in Argentina, whether it's in the United States or Russia or Britain or India, I would like to see all forms of money compete freely and interest rates compete freely and let the market set the prices of those things. Someone makes a huge silver discovery, then the value of silver relative to everything else is going to go down. But it's not going to cause enormous crashes, wars, depressions, uh, famines, because it's the interference of these people in free markets, these people. I'm not implying anything by that. I'm just saying bankers, banksters. We can go down the rabbit hole of uh, blaming certain races for that. I, I don't agree. Um, I think I could prove to you it's other people. But bankers are the ones in interest are the ones that are interested in manipulating free markets to increase their power and to increase their control. So these are the people that we're fighting against when we stack silver. Uh, it's a long, long war, as Bix Weir says. Uh, it's a 170-year-old war, maybe even longer. And, of course, we can win it. We know we can win it. That was what the Wizard of Oz was about. We've got silver slippers. And the power to return to sound money is in our hands. We just simply need to take it and use their crooked, manipulated, artificial currencies to buy real money. And that will end their system. And we'll talk to you next time.